Luke chapter 3 together on page 858, and the Bible's provided for you. If you're willing, let's stand together in honor of God's word, or you're welcome to remain seated too, if that is preferable too. So Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Atyria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Now, if any of you are in a small group and you have to read a passage like that, just read it fast, act like you know what you're doing, and you'll get through it, all right? Just like I do. But the question here is, who is this John? John, the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. This is who we're reading about. In verse 3, And John went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet. The voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Let's pray together. Heavenly Fathers, we open your word. We invite your spirit to teach us, to call to remembrance things you've taught us before or verses that we've come across. God, we need this time in our lives for you to feed us. And so we come with expectancy. Uh, wanting to behold. Can we perceive spiritually what you're doing in our lives? In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So whenever I begin reading scripture, I read it and I pray. And I'm asking God to help me understand what he wants to teach me. And as we begin a read through the Bible plan together this next year, I want to encourage you to do that in your own personal time of the Lord, is to open God's word and then ask God what he wants to teach you and then allow him to guide and direct you. And so what happens here when I look at Luke chapter three, one of the first things that comes out to me is you brood of vipers. That's interesting. And I kind of wanted to dig more in there, but there was something before I got there that jumped out at me. And that was in verse six. It says, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. What do you think of when you read that verse? Is there anything in that verse concerning to you? Like the first thing I thought is all flesh will see the salvation of God. And I said, God, is that, is that going to happen in Rock County? Will all flesh see the salvation of God? What do you mean, Lord, that all flesh will see the salvation of God? That's not been my experience as I've grown up in this world. Uh, I always feel like I'm in a minority that most of the people around me don't see the salvation of God. What does this mean? I'm reminded in John 1 that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What happened to the Word? And the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So I think the beginning here is John the Baptist is referring to the Word becoming flesh, Jesus. Uh, all flesh will see him. The Word is now in flesh, and he is going to interact on the world in a way that all history will remember. But what does it mean that they'll see the salvation? Will all people be saved? Was this a verse on universalism? And I think of, it says elsewhere in the Bible that and on that day, before the judgment seat of Christ, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And then I think to myself, am I ready for that day? And so for the Christmas Eve service, we talked about the gospel, the salvation of God that has come to us because God so loved the world that he sent his son Jesus. And so this is the gospel that John is saying all flesh will see. It's that the word became flesh. He came to earth, born in a manger. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. 
and a virgin teenager named Mary. And he would be born being fully God and fully man. And he would walk this earth without sin. And then he would take our sins upon him and he would suffer and he would shed his blood, which the scriptures teach is necessary for the forgiveness of sins. And he would die and three days later he would rise again. This is the gospel, that we can be saved and that when we trust Jesus alone for the forgiveness of sins, we become born again. And then we come into the New Testament where God gives us his spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. That one day we will be with him forever in the place that he's gone to prepare for us, John chapter 14. So this is the salvation that all flesh will see. And as we begin, my first question is, is have you seen the salvation of God in your own life? Have you received the Savior named Jesus that came at Christmas? Have you been born again, receiving the Holy Spirit? When I think of this verse, I began thinking, well, doesn't elsewhere it say, behold the Lamb of God who takes the sins of the world? And who said that? So I began looking. And then I realized in John, John, John the Baptist says in the book of John, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Then I was curious about the word see in Luke 3 and the word behold in John 1. And so I began digging, and it's the same word. So cool. So if we go back here to Luke chapter 3, verse 6, and all flesh shall behold the salvation of God. What does it mean to behold? As I was looking at that word, it means to perceive something spiritually that earthly eyes cannot see. Behold, can you perceive it? To behold is to understand something spiritually that your flesh or your earthly person would not understand. And I think as the people of God, as the body of Christ, we need to learn how to behold. And I wondered, how did John learn how to behold? And this is where it gets really cool. So then I found myself in Luke chapter 1. And when the angel came to Zechariah, the angel says to Zechariah, behold, you will be silent. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. So Zechariah learned how to behold. And then as you go down to Luke chapter one at the bottom, when, when Elizabeth is pregnant and Mary comes to visit, Elizabeth says, behold, the baby leaped within my womb. And, she, and then the Bible says, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So Zechariah learned to behold, Elizabeth learned to behold, and now their son John is going before Jesus telling the people, behold, can you perceive it? Can you see with spiritual eyes what earthly eyes cannot see? So just think about the story of John the Baptist. I mean, the Bible says, here came a guy wearing camel's hair, eating locusts and honey, which would be a spectacle in our day, right? And he was to go to the religious leaders, the Pharisees, and remember how the Pharisees were dressed? Like they were prim and proper, who had, they had beautiful flowing robes all the way to the ground. So just picture, you know, in the temple, all the Pharisees dressed in long flowing robes, very ornate and beautiful. And in walks John, dressed in camel's hair. I mean, you know, was it just shorts and he didn't have anything on his top or is he wearing a fur coat? I don't know, but he looked very different is what I'm telling you. And he's eating locusts. What's that about? I don't know that either. But it was a spectacle. And in order for the Pharisees to see, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, they had to hear from the guy in camel's hair. I've been convicted by this so many times in my life as a leader, even as I'm telling you, as I talked about the Mislankas and the Wanagers and the Stutzes. I can't see what God might call you to do. But I also have times in my mind that I have repented because I have missed it. Where God was doing something very specific in someone in the life of the church and I missed it. And the God's call on their life was significant. And I missed it. I didn't encourage them. I didn't help them. I didn't see it. Behold, can you perceive it? What about Mary? Right? She was a teenager who had not married, never been with a man, and now she's pregnant. 
Can you perceive it? Behold. Behold the salvation of God in a pregnant teenager. Can you perceive with spiritual eyes what earthly eyes cannot see? When I think of the word behold, I think of, now teenagers, I'm not trying to be cool, but I've seen you do this, so I want you to help me. If you have some way to describe with your hands mind blown, what would you do? Well, come on, do it for me. Mind blown, what would you do, right? <laughs> right? That's behold. If you think of behold, just think mind blown. <laughs> so when John the Baptist says behold, <laughs> the salvation of God, just let it blow your mind. When I was a teenager, my youth pastor told me, Jason, you have to see through Jesus' glasses. I mean, you can't look at life through your own perspective. You have to put on Jesus' glasses. You have to see it spiritually. You can't just look at it earthly, and that was such a help to me for all my life. We see this elsewhere in Scripture in 2 Kings 6. The people of God are surrounded by the enemy. And when the servant of the Lord rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Chicken little, the sky is falling. We're going to die. This is it. It's all over. In verse 16, Elisha says, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots and fire all around Elisha. In 2 Kings 6, the people of God are surrounded by the enemy and there's no way out. There's no way in their earthly sight they can possibly see God's deliverance until Elisha prays, O Lord, open our eyes that we might behold. Open our eyes that we might perceive with spiritual eyes what our earthly eyes cannot see. And this is what Paul Paul prays for the believers in Ephesians 1, verses 18. That the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened, that we would know what is the hope to which we've been called, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly places. Here's what Paul is praying for believers. I pray that you would behold. You would be able to see with spiritual eyes the great riches of the inheritance, the great hope that you've been called to, and the power of God that's at work in your life, which is the same power that God used to raise him from the dead. So my alarm went off this morning. Eh, 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 eh bad word forms in the back of my head. Oh, Lord, I don't want to wake up with bad words in my head, but I can't get out of bed this morning. And you know what I'm telling the Lord when I can't get out of bed this morning? That it's going to take a bigger miracle to get a tired Jason out of bed than it took to get a dead Jesus out of the grave. (laughs) Right? Because when my alarm goes off, I'm not thinking about the power of God that has worked within me. I'm just thinking I'm tired. I don't want to get up. Can you perceive it? Behold the salvation of God. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the power of God. In Psalm 51, David prays, Restore to me the joy of my salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Why do believers lose the joy of salvation? Why would we pray to restore the joy of our salvation? And I think it has to do with this idea of beholding. I think we forget to behold. We start looking at life through our earthly eyes. We get carnal. We forget to see life through spiritual eyes and we no longer behold the salvation of God. When I wake up in the morning and a bad word forms in the back of my mind, I'm reminded I'm a sinner. I needed a savior this morning. It's not even lunchtime yet and I've already blown it. And yet God is so gracious to forgive me and cleanse me of my sin. And his spirit is so long-suffering with me to be patient with me and wrestle me out of bed and get me going the direction that he's called me to go. God called me to preach today. Behold, Jason, can you perceive what God wants to do in your life? No, Lord, I want to stay in bed. This is the battle of beholding for me. Can I behold what God wants to do spiritually on a Sunday morning? Or am I just stuck in my earthly sight? 
You're able to behold the Savior if you're more concerned about your own daily struggle with sin than someone else's sin. And we lose the joy of our salvation. We no longer behold the greatness of God because we forget we're sinners. And we start doing life on our own efforts, convincing ourselves we're really good people that can do great things for God. And we no longer function out of a need for a Savior. And we lose the joy of our salvation. And we no longer behold the salvation of God. Brothers and sisters, behold the salvation of God today. Be aware of your own sin and how great is God's forgiveness through Christ. So let's talk about Zechariah a minute. Zechariah the dad teaches John the Baptist to behold, I think, because when the angel comes to Zechariah and says, you're going to be a dad, Zechariah's like, (laughs) in my earthly understanding, that's impossible, Lord. That's impossible. And so the angel lays it out for him that Elizabeth's going to become pregnant. And then the angel says this in Luke 120, and behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. So from the time the angel comes to talk to Zechariah till the time John is born and it's time to name him, Zechariah suffers from muteness. He cannot speak. And the first question in my mind is, whose fault is it, right? Well, is this Zechariah's fault? That's because this is his consequence for sin. And yet elsewhere in the scriptures, Gideon asked for a sign and it was not counted to him as sin. And then I just feel this conviction. Here's the problem. And here's what I want to touch on suffering. So Zechariah learned, behold, you'll suffer, right? And in the American church, a lot of times, I think we're getting loose on our theology of suffering. And I think we need to be intentional that we look at suffering through the lens of scripture and we don't immediately try to assess blame when someone suffers, okay? Okay. Because this happened elsewhere in Scripture. Do you remember when the man was born blind in John 3, or John 9? And the disciples asked Jesus, Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. God used blindness in that man to help people behold to see something with spiritual eyes that earthly eyes could not see. God was going to use the suffering of that blind man to display himself through that suffering. It happened with Saul or Paul in the book of Acts. So when God calls Saul and he meets on the Damascus road, he's struck with blindness. And it says he was blind for three days and the Lord calls Ananias to go to Saul and Ananias is afraid because who could have perceived that God would use Saul who had murdered so many and been so violently opposed to the believers. And the Lord says, Ananias, you need to go to Saul. Acts 9, 16, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So God's call on Paul's life included suffering. In the book of Habakkuk, I love this verse. I learned it as a teenager, and it was like, watch and be amazed. Behold, I'm going to do something in your day that you would not believe even if I told you. So as a teenager, I started off with this wonder about the greatness of God and the great things he was going to do. And I want that for all of you. But as Paul Harvey says, the rest of the story, if you keep reading in Habakkuk 1, this new thing God's going to do is he says, I'm going to raise up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to to seize dwellings not their own. Really, Lord? That's the great new work you're going to do? Sounds like suffering to me. You're going to raise up the Babylonians and impetuous and ruthless people who are going to steal things that aren't their own? How can that be the work of God? Behold, psh, the suffering of his servants. Can we perceive spiritually something in suffering that our earthly eyes cannot see? This is what Zechariah learned. Recently I had COVID and I was very sick for much longer than I cared to be. So I spent time in the book of Job and I went back through. And the reason I want to highlight this for you today is I think the 
I think the church, we need to be prepared for suffering, to suffer in a way that will coincide with what God says in his word. And as I went back to the book of Job, what I noticed is that Job's suffering went on way longer than he cared to have it go on. And that it went on way longer than his friends cared to have it go on. His friends sat with him for a whole week in silence. Well, these are some incredible friends. But then as Job and his friends begin to talk and they begin trying to assess what is going on here, it just becomes a blame fest. And so I want to say some things to you that I've heard that I want to cautious us against, but I want to first tell you I'm one of Job's friends. I do this all the time when I get sick or when I suffer. And I try to assess blame. I try to figure out how I can fix it, okay? So we all are Job's friends and we all have said things maybe we shouldn't say. And let's just talk about a few of them today so we can, as a family of God, help each other well when we suffer, okay? So I've heard it said, well, COVID isn't from God, so it's not God's will for Christians to have COVID. And that sounds really good, but I just want to suggest this. I don't think that's biblical because I think biblically it is God's will for his servants to suffer sometimes. And we don't get to choose when that is or what avenue of suffering we have. I mean, Paul said there was a thorn in his flesh. He was suffering physically with something and he pleaded with God to take it away from him and the Lord said, no. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Sometimes we say, well, we assess blame like, well, you know, I got sick. People ask me, well, were you wearing a mask or weren't you wearing a mask? Are you vaccinated or aren't you vaccinated? And who are you with? Were they wearing a mask or were they not wearing a mask? Or were you with vaccinated people or with unvaccinated people? Like, we're just trying to assess whose fault is it? And all I could say was, I'm sick. I'm sick. I got sick. People get sick. My kids asked me a question. They said, Dad, when you had COVID, were you in like some kind of demonic stronghold or something? Or... So we talked about it as a family. And I said, no, kids, I think I was sick. I got sick. But we talked about demonic strongholds. And we talked about how when we have unconfessed, unrepentant sin, we give the enemy an opportunity for a stronghold and that we need to be cautious right that, that we don't continue in unrepentant sin um, we talked about healing I'm not speaking against spiritual warfare I'm not speaking against healing the, the Lord did a miracle and healed a ruptured disc in my neck in, in 1993 I believe in miraculous healing I've been part of deliverance prayer services where someone has been delivered from demonic possession in Jesus name all of these things are real, but when it comes to suffering of the Lord's servants, sometimes it's just the Lord's will that we suffer. And we just need to wait on him. The suffering is for an appointed time. And when his time comes, he will come for us. And so in the book of Job, we get to the end in Job 42. And Job says this about, he, he looks back at all of the things he suffered and, and all the discussions he's had with his friends and trying to figure out whose fault is it. And, and Job says this, he said, my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Behold the suffering of his servants. Behold, you will see God. And as God has taught me to behold him throughout my life, oftentimes it's come through suffering. So one morning I had COVID and it was really the low point for me. I, was, I had just horrendous migraines and it was in so much pain. And I was isolated from my family, so I'm in the basement by myself. And I had woke up at 4.30 in so much pain I could not bear it. So I had moved from the bed of the couch and I'm just, and Stephanie, bless her heart, came down and she says, how are you doing? Or what's wrong, I think she said to me, because she could see I was writhing in pain. And I didn't want to answer her because I didn't want her to know I was crying. And I just said, I'm in pain. And she was so sweet to bring me pain medicine. Now then, consistently, consistently. But in that, in the lowest point, here's, here's what I wrestled with, okay? Was it my fault I was sick? Was God judging me because I had screwed up? Or was I lacking faith? I mean, I had people say to me, well, I had COVID for 24 hours. I spiked the fever, and then here was my spiritual regimen. And I claimed this promise, and I rebuked this, and I... And I did this, and man, the Lord healed me in 24 hours, which praise the Lord. But for me, I'm suffering now, many days into it. And so now in my tears, I'm saying, Lord, is there something wrong with my faith that I'm still suffering? And you know what? My ears had heard of him, 
but my eyes got to see him. Because you know what the Lord said to me? No, Jason, I'm right here. I'm right here. I'm weeping with you. I'm walking with you. This is for an appointed time. And when it's over, it'll be over. But right now, this is where you and I are going to be together. Okay, Lord. 1 Peter 4.19 says, So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. If you look into the scriptures, you're going to see story after story where it was God's will for his people to suffer. In Leviticus chapter 14, he he leads the Israelites into the promised land. And you know what it says in Leviticus 14.34? It says, Now when I bring you into the land, into the good possession I'm giving you, and when you live in homes you did not build, and you live in homes filled with good things you did not provide, Deuteronomy 6.11. And then he says this, and I put a spreading mildew in your house. Here's what you do. My families live this. You clear out all the porous materials. You get rid of all your drapes and carpet, clothes, stuffed animals, throw them away. Then you have to assess the house and you start ripping apart timber by timber until you find the mold. And then you start building it back up. And we spent thousands of thousands of dollars remediating mold in our home so we could sell it. God chose to have the Eddies walk through suffering. And so we had to commit ourselves to our creator and be faithful to continue to do good. But we didn't get to set the timetable of his suffering, but we got to see him in a new way. When I was a teenager, I prayed Philippians 3, 10, 11. I want to know Christ, to share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. American church, if we do not think that suffering is a part of God's will, we're going to walk into mental illness. We're going to walk into a strange relationships through judging where the suffering came from. And as the body of Christ, we need to prepare ourselves to suffer for Christ's sake. And we need to do it with contentment, as Philippians 4 says. And we need to do it with faith. And we need to do it with boldness, that it doesn't mess up our prayer life. We'll keep praying while we're suffering. And I said this to Stephanie, if he doesn't raise me up today, he'll do it tomorrow because I'm waiting on the Lord and he will renew my strength. And God did raise me back up. It just wasn't in my time. So the angel says to Zechariah, behold, you will be silent. Behold, you will suffer. And you will be able to behold the Savior if you're content in weakness, if you can boast about brokenness, and if you cannot be concerned that something strange is happening to you, but you can learn to rejoice in suffering knowing that your suffering will produce character, perseverance, hope, You will never be disappointed when you walk with the Lord through suffering. Thirdly, Elizabeth said, Behold, the baby in my womb leaped. The Bible says when you become born again, God puts his Holy Spirit in you. Just as Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, every believer has the Holy Spirit in you. And if we're going to behold, if we're going to see things with spiritual eyes that our earthly eyes can't see, we're going to have to behold the Spirit's work in our life. So when I read the scriptures, this is why I want to caution us about a read through the Bible in a year program. Don't get so caught up in completion that you miss beholding. So when I read Luke 3, the spirit leaped in me at verse 6. And on my journey, I wound up in Luke 1, verse 20, and Luke 1, verse 44. So if I had been doing a read through the Bible in a year program and I was reading verses 3 through 7... I would have missed all of this if I had just hurried on to chapter 4 and 5 and 6 and I'm like, yep, did it. Check it off. There was no beholding. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2.14 that the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. Elizabeth sensed the spirits moving in her life she was able to behold and see that her pregnant cousin was carrying the son of god she didn't see that with earthly eyes she saw it with spiritual eyes and the bible says in john 14 as we close the musicians need to come that the helper of the holy spirit whom the father will send in my name he will teach you all things and he will bring to your remembrance all that i've said to you When you read God's word, you need to behold with spiritual eyes what the Spirit is saying. And you need to hear him say pause on this verse. It might be a question. I have a question about that verse. That might be the Spirit saying, behold. It might be a word jumps out to you. You're like, 
Why can I not get that word out of my mind? Why can't I get see? It was, in all flesh will see the salvation of God. I could not get see out of my mind. See, what does that word see mean? And that's how I wound up at behold. Can you perceive it? Brothers and sisters, I pray that we can behold the salvation of God. I pray that we can behold what God is doing when we suffer. And I pray that we can behold the Spirit's working in our life, that we can see with spiritual eyes what cannot be seen through earthly eyes. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I'm reminded this morning, even when the Muslank is here, that I cannot behold or perceive what you may have prepared for these brothers and sisters that I'm with this morning. But I know you have a very specific plan for their life. And I thank you that you have brought us to a place where we can behold the salvation of God. We can talk about the gospel and we can have a desire to want to respond to it by your spirits. So I pray that uh, for anyone who has not been born again, that today would be the day of salvation for them and that they would behold the salvation of God. God, and I pray for believers that we would behold the working of your spirit in our lives, that we would not become carnal and try to live our life with what we can see physically, but that we would behold you're doing a new thing. Behold, your spirit is helping us understand things spiritually that cannot be discerned for the physical man. God, I pray that you'd help us to be full of faith during suffering, that we'd encourage our brothers and sisters when we suffer, that we would not be surprised but that we would be looking how we can know Jesus more, even in suffering. Behold, can you perceive what God is doing spiritually when you suffer? And God, I pray most of all that we would perceive your spirit at work in our lives. Behold, the spirit of God who leaps within us and affirms the gospel. God, as I walked back to the lobby on Sunday night after preaching the gospel, someone pulled me aside and said, Pastor, when you were preaching, something jumped in me. Your spirit does affirm your word. So we invite you, spirit, to affirm your word to us. In Jesus' name, amen.